there. So this is technically the 15th Sunday in Pentecost, but we're not studying Pentecost. We're start, we're, we started a couple of weeks ago a series of approximately 13 weeks. It'll take us up to the beginning of Advent. Advent will do something else. We're going to study the miracles of Jesus. The first chunk of that time, we are looking at the seven signs that John included in his gospel. He called them signs. Signs that would convince you that Jesus is the Christ, and through believing in him, you will have eternal life. John says that specifically. Notice my quote. Oops. In John chapter 20, that this is important. You need to understand that Jesus is the Christ and believing in him is what this is all about. So um, that gave us seven signs. And, and then so we've set out to cover them. And just because of timing, we are to the sixth and seventh sign now. Um, and then here, this is the document. We are talking about two miracles. And um, the first one is the blind man. This is another example of a, of a healing where the person asking, or the person healed doesn't ask. Um, his Jesus uh, disciples say, Lord, who who sinned here? Well, why is there you know why is there sickness? Now Jews believed that that they were being authentic Jews. If somebody was if somebody was suffering a illness, the explanation was that God caused it. God caused to to the Jewish mind. God causes all good things and all bad things. So if there is a suffering person. There must be a sin to explain it, because God wouldn't arbitrarily punish an innocent person. So that, that person, or maybe his parents, there was all kinds of rabbinical contemplation about, is it possible for the soul to sin before it's born? For example, I'm, I'm just saying that they, they were trying to figure this out. Why, why would, would illness happen if there wasn't an obvious sin to, to point to. So maybe they even got into a reincarnation idea. This is hard to believe that Jews would have this thought, but is it a prior previous life? Where, where, where did the sin come from? So they're being authentic Jews when they ask this question. So they obviously were not starting on the premise that they themselves were sinners. <laughs> right? Because were they all the same? They, uh, they fair, fair. You know, I, I didn't put that together. That is the corollary of that argument. Since I am not suffering today, I must be perfect. That's a good way to go through life, right? It's only, it's only the sick people who are sinners, like Debbie. She, she's, she's suffering long-term COVID. Well, <laughs> poor, poor, poor Debbie. Okay. We, we will have to go through a confession and forgiveness. Okay, thank you, Carson. Okay, I, I'm Tim. Tim, this this does fit. This does fit that Pharisaic mind, though. The Pharisees believed that they could follow the law, and that they were not sinners which would explain why God was blessing their life. That's how, that's how this whole logic worked. Jesus is confronted with that. His disciples actually confront him with this thought. And, and you all remember this answer. This is, this is kind of Sunday School 101, but no, it's, it's not neither this man nor his parents sinned. So Jesus is, is wiping out that whole logic. He doesn't make a big deal about it, but he has just thrown that whole school of thought out. Here's a man suffering, and it's not because he or his parents have sinned. Now, we also have an explanation that involves sin. What is 
our understanding of the role of sin in this poor guy's suffering? Any thoughts? We do, we do have an answer. It's related to the Garden of Eden story and the curse. When sin enters the world, people die. And related to that death is all the sickness that comes with it. We don't have any way to draw the direct line. So it, I don't have to be able to show your sin and your sickness. We live in a broken, broken world. Sin has caused this break. So to that extent, the Jews were correct. Sin causes illness, but, but not a specific punishment for your sins. Uh, Jesus could... could Adam and Eve saved. Pardon? Adam and Eve saved, they died spiritually. Saved is a different concept. But before Jesus existed in the timeline, all the Old Testament folks, all the Old Testament folks died before Christ. I'll, I'll use the word if. If they are saved. They are still saved through Christ because everyone who is saved is saved through Christ. Even though they never knew the name, I have no idea how this works. That's all I can say. People are saved by Christ. If David or Adam are saved, it's because of Christ. I don't know how that works. I don't know. It, it is a, it's an interesting question. Uh, Adam and Eve saved. Per, Revelation through the Old Testament was progressing. Yes. When the sacrificial system was inaugurated, people believed in the shedding of blood would forgive their sins. So they participated in that system and they were saved because that's all the revelation they had at the time. I would suspect that Adam and Eve. This Cain or Abel was the first one to put the blood sacrifice. So you could say that maybe Cain and Abel fell on the best of him, but I don't see that with Adam and Eve. Adam, Adam and Eve is tough because they died before there was any law. That's right. There was no law. There was no. Law. Well, they had one law: don't eat that tree. You can't eat of that tree. That's true. They had one rule and they broke it. So uh, that yes, uh, Paul refers to him that way too. He was a the, the a I'll use a a son of God. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We'll never finish. Let's, let's go on. Um, Jesus completes his answer though. It wasn't because this guy or his parents. Said. It was because the work of God might be displayed in his life. Then we have verse four and five. Remember last week we were talking about the fact that the Jews got upset that he worked on Sunday. He, he, did, a, he did a miracle on Sunday. He, this was common. Uh, Jesus liked to poke fun at the, at the Pharisees so he would perform his miracles on, at the synagogue. Uh, I don't really know if that was his purpose, but that's what he ended up doing. What are the Saturdays? I, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, Saturday the Sabbath. Yes. So he would he would perform his miracles, and that would get him upset because he was working on Sunday, Saturday, and and so um, he he did say then that while God did rest on the seventh day of of creation, that was his last day off. God does not take. Saturdays off, according to Jesus last week. He works all the time, and then this is where he got in trouble. Jesus said, and so do I. I don't take any time off. So 24-7 uh, is my logic. He, I'm, I'm working. Pardon? Uh, well, I, I, God doesn't I don't know whether he wants or needs for vacation. It's not his existence. Remember, he said his name is I am. And so I'm going to interpret that as he is always on. Always on. God never stops. Um, now, now remember, 
this guy, this guy who is is blind is there, but he has not been involved in any of this conversation. This is between Jesus and his disciples. Now Jesus does an odd thing. We've had we've had some miracles where Jesus just thinks it and it happens. Remember the official whose uh, son was dying. Jesus didn't do anything. He just said, go home, your son will live. He didn't do any hocus pocus. Okay. At the at the miracle in Cana. He does he doesn't say any words about the wine. He tells the uh, workers, fill the jars, dip some out and take it to the to the uh, leader of the banquet. And somewhere in that process, Jesus' mind said, I want the water to be wine. So he's done miracles where apparently there was nothing involved at all. And then we get this strange one. He spits on the ground. And by the way, it's the Sabbath again. Spitting on the ground and making paste out of the mud is a Sabbath violation. He's doing pottery here. He's, he's making something out of clay. Well, in this case, it's mud. But anyway, he puts it on the man's eyes. Now, would you be offended? Remember, he hasn't asked for anything. Maybe, maybe he likes his gig where he sits there and begs for money because he's blind. Anyway. Jesus puts the mud on his eyes and says, go, uh, wash in the pool of Siloam. So I ask over there in my questions, this method's odd, but it does at least involve the man in the miracle. He has to get up now and go to the pool and wash his eyes. So we could say that's he's involved in his own miracle. But on the other hand, if you had mud on your eyes, wouldn't you want to wash it off? So maybe there's no faith here at all. It's just good advice. Go wash your eyes. You've got mud on your eyes. I don't know whether Jesus intends for the man to embrace his own miracle or not. We usually think of faith that way. But in this case, because the guy does have to wash his eyes, I'm not, I'm not sure it quite raises, rises to that level. Now, I, th I think that dust refers to God making man out of dust. Okay, we are, we are made from, from dust. Yep. Okay. Now, the, the rest of this discussion here in this first the chapter uh, nine is how people related to, to this miracle. Um, the first reaction by the people watching this is, Oh, oh, sorry. I, I, this happens immediately after the guy goes and washes his eyes. So now he can see. Okay. So the explanation, it's not him. We're, we're, we're mistaken. This is not, you know, John, the blind guy. This is somebody else. That was the first, his neighbors and those who'd formerly seen him begging. Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was. No, he only looks like him. You can, you can appreciate that they're having trouble getting their mind around this miracle. The smart money is, no, it, miracles don't happen. So this guy must not be the blind man. This is somebody else. That's the smart money. The believer says, well, no, it could happen. Uh, he was asked, I guess officially, although it doesn't say who asks him, but it's probably the officials in the temple because they, they notice this guy washing his face and, and it's, it's the Sabbath, remember? The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and now I can see. So that kind of dashes any expectation that 
blind man was operating in faith. Even we know who Jesus was. They called him. They called Jesus. Yeah, he see he, he seems to be cooperating with the authorities. Now the Pharisees are working on that same logic. Well, this must not be the guy who's blind. So um Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I was going to involve the parents come next. The, the next argument is an interesting one. The Pharisees say, we, we've got a problem with this whole idea of miracles. If Jesus is from God, he wouldn't break the law, the, the Ten Commandment type law. And one of the laws is don't work on the Sabbath. So if Jesus is from God, he shouldn't work on the Sabbath. I think that's a pretty good logic. It just, it misses, and this is the point that Jesus makes, is, but, but even you make allowance in an emergency. Sometimes, you, you know, the general principle, don't work on the Sabbath, that, that, he, he's okay with that. But if his two examples are if your child or your animal falls into a well or a ditch, you will get the animal out of the ditch. You won't say, well, it's the Sabbath. I'll let you just lay there in the dirt until, until Sunday morning when I can come in and get you out. No, you, you, you take steps. And that's the category Jesus puts these healings in. I'm, people are suffering. I'm, I'm fixing the suffering. It doesn't bother me that it's the Sabbath. They asked the blind, the guy who was blind, they asked him, well, what, what's your explanation of this? The man used a general term a Jew would use. He must be a prophet. He must have the power of God working through him. That's what a prophet does, right? A prophet is somebody affected by the Holy Spirit. So that, that's a good explanation. He must be a prophet. The, the uh, Pharisees move on to another argument. They say, well, <clears throat> again, he, he, this must not be the blind man. So they go to the blind man's parents. Now, the blind man's parents, the blind, ex-blind man's parents have a problem. It is generally known in the community that anyone who is consorting with Jesus will be kicked out of the synagogue. They will lose their social position. And so here their son has been found to be in this relationship with Jesus. They are afraid. So if they were to say publicly that Jesus healed their son, who had been blind since birth, they are engaged with Jesus, they could lose their social standing. So they want off that hook. They're not very nice to their son about it, but that's basically what they say. Look, he's old enough. He's of age. Ask him, what, what do we have to do with this? The Pharisees seem to accept that, so they ask him. They summon the man. We know this man is a sinner, they say to him. And then he gives an answer that's very familiar to, to Christians. I don't know whether he is a sinner or not. Remember, the guy works on the Sabbath, so it depends on your definition. We don't believe Jesus ever sinned, but okay, we'll give him that argument. I was blind, but now I see, is what the guy says. End of argument. That's where that one, that's where that discussion ends. The, the, the Jews don't get their good answer about working on the Sabbath or whatever the testimony of the guy born blind is that he was once blind and now he can see i think people most often give that line credit 
for this guy's faith. That's a statement of faith. It's also a statement of fact. He used to be blind and now he can see. Just that's and, and to add to that, Doug, not working on the Sabbath really refers to taking that time to worship God and give him thanks. Yes, we 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 definitely, because we have moved the needle quite a bit on the Sabbath, um, we concentrate on a, a time for worship. Make make sure you take time. We all remember the blue laws when you couldn't you couldn't go to stores on on Sunday. Most trade and business stopped on Sunday. There were some exceptions. Carson, uh, I got three thoughts. One is uh, I think God is unpredictable. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, Jesus would do a miracle without the recipient being involved, and other times uh, that recipient worked very, very hard to get the piece. Yep, that is true. The other one is um, Jesus, in my opinion, Jesus could do any miracle he wanted just by not even moving the finger. And I think he had demonstrated this. He had the he, he couldn't just sit there and say, and think, okay, calm the storm. He might as well say, speak to it so that they know what he's doing. So he can he can tell us. You know, yeah. he, he, he has to consider his audience so they can see it. Yes. Okay. Well, it's it's good to have you back, Carson. Okay. Um, I I agree. Uh, Jesus is involved in teaching his disciples and the other people who are around him. And so it could be that Jesus wanted to make a bigger play out of this. So the mud on the eyes was, was a way to get other people who could see that he was engaging in a healing miracle here. Um, so it's the audience. Yeah. It could also be the young man. He now has to go and, and be involved in his miracle. I, I, I don't really know. Um, any other comments on this first miracle? Okay, well, because we do have a little bit of time, we move to Lazarus. Lazarus is in a family. We, we know Mary and Martha from the Mary and Martha gathering. They invite Jesus to lunch one day. Martha complains that Mary's not helping with the housework. One of my favorite stories. I tend to be a Martha in my thinking. And, you know, anyway, this is that family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus is now introduced to us here, but he is immediately off the stage. Um, Lazarus is sick. They, they live in Bethany, and Bethany is only uh, maybe a day's walk away. The sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. I, I don't know. We, we don't have any biblical um, teaching on the previous relationship of Lazarus and Jesus. This implies there was one, we, but we don't know what, what it was. Um, Mary refers, or Mary and Martha, refer to Lazarus as the one you love. Um, could it be that it's their love that they're really talking about? It's not what it says, but could it be the one we love is sick and include him in that? Someone, yes, the understanding is this was a relatively well-off family in the in the Bethany area where he could rely on having a place to eat and sleep. And yes, when he came, he came with a large entourage. So so they were welcoming. They were good friends. I, I we don't know. Okay, Jesus hears this and and um, he says right away, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. 
And then he sits and does nothing for two days. Well, actually, we don't know that he did nothing. He just did not go to Bethany. Well, there was already two days. So it, the scripture says two more. Let's see. It's in verse uh, six. He stayed there where he was two more days. So it's a total of four days. Uh, there's also, well, there's also a travel day to get to Bethany. So maybe maybe that's where you're thinking of the four. I, I don't know. Anyway, he does not rush to Lazarus' side. He doesn't even do one of those healings like we know he could do. Remember the centurion's son? Or I, I, let's do the one that's in John. The, the official's son, it was the centurion's servant, not the son anyway. But anyway, the, the, the uh, official's son was healed at a distance. He could have just projected that healing to Lazarus, and that would have been how this story ended. But that's not what happens. He purposely waits for Lazarus to die. That's hard. Probably was hard on him. He's going to weep in this. But anyway. So two days pass. So, so finally, let's go back to Judea. That's where Bethany is. Let's go back. Now, the disciples uh, were now getting into this. Uh, Judea was a recent place where they must have had some trouble with the crowds. Uh, I don't know specifically which event they're talking about. Uh, but the last time we were there, they wanted to stone him. That's what verse 8 says. Um, I don't know which story to that, if that refers. Then Jesus has this paragraph. This is one of the times where you have to really scratch your head. And, what, what is, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbled, for he has no light. Ah, way too deep, Jesus. Give it. I had to go to a commentator to give some help. What, what, what's he talking about here? And my commentator simply said, Jesus knows it is not his time to die. A trip to Judea will not end up in his death. That, that that's all this is. The the version about light and stumbling in the dark. It's 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 not yet dark. Darkness is going to overcome him on Good Friday. That's when he will die. So he is completely free to go to Judea anytime he wants. It will not end in his stoning. Uh, I appreciate that there are commentators who have done a lot more thinking about this than I have. Anyway. Then he says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. Now, we're going to know later in the story that he's been dead for four days. So it's, it's not sleep, Jesus, but he's using this language. The difference is that when somebody does fall asleep, they can later get up. When people die, they don't get up. So he's actually right to use that, that picture. Sleep is a good picture because he is going, Lazarus is going to get up. Doesn't mean he didn't die. He's, died. he's dead in four days. Lord, if he's sleeping, he will get better. No, no, no. Jesus says it's, it's death. It's just not. Anyway. He finally tells them Lazarus is dead. Then we have another one of those confusing paragraphs. Now Thomas gets into this. All this conversation about death has happened. So Thomas, remember that's doubting Thomas, says, let's go with him, that we all may die with him. Thomas is here. He's picking up on the death the last time they were in Judea. He has misunderstood what Jesus is talking about, death versus sleep and whatever. He thinks Jesus is committing to go to Judea to die. He has exactly the wrong idea here. But Thomas is saying, let's go. We promised to go with this guy even to death. Now's the time, according to Thomas. 
So he didn't understand what you said. No, he didn't understand that paragraph either. He needs a better commentator. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, you, if you've ever seen one of the movies, you'll, you'll appreciate this scene. Um, Jesus arrives. He, you know he's going to solve the problem. But a Jewish funeral is terrible. You, you've got hundreds of people, and you've got these people who are wailing. They, they actually pay people to scream. It's awful. So it's bedlam. I don't know how, you know how many people were in the village, but it's just a crowd of yelling people. And in comes Jesus into this scene. He doesn't go all the way to their house. Uh, he makes it maybe to the edge of town. Word is sent. Martha comes out. Martha's first. Mary comes second. Martha gives some wonderful testimony here. It's clear that she is a believer. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Probably a very honest and truthful statement. I, 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 I doubt if Jesus would have sat at his bedside and let him die. Uh, the story would be different if he did it that way. Uh, he, he was several villages over, and he let him die. I appreciate that, but it would be much harder if he was actually sitting there in the room. This is certainly a statement of faith. Yes, if you had been here, I've seen you do healing, you would have healed Lazarus, no question. But then look at verse 22. She goes a step further. Even now, but now I know, even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She is asking him, to fix this problem. So she knows what he, what he, she doesn't know what he's about to do, but she knows what he can do. She may never have seen something like this, but she's asking for it. No, this is Martha, not the marriage. I know this is, that's right, that's right. This is Martha, this is Martha. Working. Yeah, this is the, uh, Jesus tries to, um, move the conversation, uh, he will rise again. I know all about the resurrection, Martha says. <laughs> That's not quite what I mean. I, I, I want it now. I want it now. Then Jesus gives this line. It's again, his fa favorite of Christians. I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked Martha. Yes. And then this is as good a language as Peter got when he gave his testimony. You are the Christ, the son of God who was to come into the world. She brings Mary. Martha goes down, brings Mary. Mary says essentially the same thing. Uh, teacher, uh, uh, I lost track. There, there it is in verse 32. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She is weeping, and now she, she the conversation doesn't become as theological. Uh, with Mary, she just starts crying. Jesus responds to her weeping. I don't know if, did, did, actually, didn't I, I thought I added these words. Yeah, here it is, I, I, I lost. Jesus weeps with her, and I don't know exactly why. Is he weeping because Mary's weeping? She's his friend, she is suffering, so he gets involved in her suffering. Is he, um, is he weeping because of this situation that he's created? He, he could have healed right away. Um, he didn't. So we have death and we have all the trauma related to that. Is that the problem? Or is it a deeper issue? Death is a real reality for most 
no, I'm going to change that. For all human beings, death is a reality. People die and they suffer. And Jesus is, pray, is weeping because of that general condition, which he's going to solve ultimately with the cross, but, but not at this moment. So he's weeping with Mary. Can you explain that? Can I explain what? Jesus knows what's, what's going to happen. Why would not he be weeping? That, well, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get at. Yeah, he's a, he's a human being. I, 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 that's where I was, I was going to go. He, he's a human being. Mary is standing in front of him in tears. He is, he is overcome with that with, through an empathy. Uh, as I said, it could also be that he knows that he has created this situation. He, he could have acted differently like he did with, in other healings. He could have healed Lazarus at a distance and this, this whole story would be different. And so people wouldn't have been affected. I don't know. Well, I, this is a great opportunity for him to demonstrate his capabilities. Yes, and that's where he, he, he knows that. And that's where he's going. But he also demonstrated his humanness. Yeah, I think like so. With his his, yeah, I, I think so. He, he's, he's, he's about to do a miracle. <laughs> he's about to do a miracle, which is the activity of God. But he is also a human being and he loves these people. Now, uh, he tells uh, Martha to, to remove the stone. And, and Martha says, oh, Lord. It's going to be a bad odor. The uh, King James has a better ver better language on this. Anybody know? He stinketh. That's what King James says. He stinketh. Yes, it's it's a, it's bad, Lord. He's been in there for four days. Yes, this is not this is not a good thing. Don't worry. anyway. Didn't I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus prays, thanking God. But then he doesn't ask God to raise Lazarus. That's not, he's thanking God because God hears him. But Jesus commands Lazarus come out. Lazarus come out. I've used <laughs> the voice, the voice of God. I, I've I've used this story before. I I I think this is an amazing thing. Lazarus is dead. He is at the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven, sitting at the table, enjoying all that wonderful abundance. And a waiter comes over and taps him on the shoulder and says, Lazarus, you have a call. And he has to get up from the table in heaven, in glory, and go back down to earth. That's great. Yes, he has to go back. He was in heaven in glory. But maybe well, that's what you this is. <laughs> well it could yeah he, he knows he knows that Lazarus is not suffering at all and he's going to have to call him back I, I know it, it's it's an amazing thought but but the other thing that occurs to me about that image by the way that none of that's biblical none of that tapping on the shoulder but <clears throat> the the will of God is done perfectly in heaven so what what goes through Lazarus' mind when, when the waiter taps him on the shoulder and says, Jesus is calling? It, it doesn't occur to him for a moment to disagree. He gets up from the table and goes back to life. Now, this is not, this is not resurrection. This is a raising because Lazarus has to die again. He ends up dying again. Yeah, we don't know the story, but he's going to have another natural death and he's going to be dead. That's not the case with the resurrection. The resurrection is the final resurrection body, which is eternal. Now, we are out of time and I'll let Tim
cut touch bases here, but I want to I want to um, point out that this is this is probably the grandest miracle that Jesus performed, and it was very public. There were hundreds of people in Bethany that day who saw Lazarus walking around. So this was this was a big miracle. And you would have thought that everybody would have just suddenly become a believer. This, this is it. He can, he can do anything. He must be God. But look at look at 45 through 47. There were many Jews who had come to visit Mary, who had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. Okay, that's the positive. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. And then they go through this whole, I, I went ahead and recorded the whole discussion. It's not really terribly important for understanding the miracle. But basically, they decide to kill him. It's a plot to kill Jesus. He's got to go. And Caiaphas, the high priest, even says, it's better that one die so that all will live. Now, he's not talking theology like we do. He's talking about Rome. If Rome gets wind of this, who knows what power the Pharisees would lose. So let, let's get rid of this guy so we can keep our little, little cozy relationship with Rome. That's what he meant. But what we know is that Jesus' death on the cross really makes death, the curse of death, uh, expire over. We are no longer subject to that curse. So anyway, that's where I will end Lazarus. Now, Tim has an opportunity next week to do a much better, much, a much better job. I'm going to change the share. We always end with the Lord's Prayer. Let me do, let me do some quick window swapping here. We now have the Lord's Prayer on the screen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, um, anything else for the good of the cause? Be safe, be blessed. Have a good trip. Doug. Out to San Francisco. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for your good wishes. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's it. Well, that, that, that's in the back of our mind, but I, I have I have kind of a Zen approach to that. If if it happens, I mean we have no control over airline cancellation, so we'll just see what happens. So I'm gonna end the meeting. That means the recording stops, and so now you can say whatever you want to say.